Welcome back to the Meaningful People Podcast. We always start off with those wordings. I want to keep this in, but we always nachi nai are always like, should we change up how we started off? Meaningful People Podcast. Ooh. Welcome back. We missed you guys. And here we are with another really incredible episode. I think like, I love this one. This is like yeah. top, top, top. I usually get goosebumps every here and there on episodes. Mm -hmm. This episode, I got the biggest goosebumps this person, he's incredible. He's obviously such a energetic, fun, positive person. Right. Went through craziness in his life and has so many experiences. Yeah, just close your eyes, buckle down, and, and the story that you're going to hear is Ooh. just incredible. And there's, I'm sure people who are listening that you know Rabbi Nissel, maybe he was your teacher or your Rebbe, and I'm sure there are people who are listening who don't know who he is. But keep listening because this episode is unreal and I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Meaningful People Podcast, the podcast where we talk to people who are meaningful. Yeah, that sounds good. All right, we are sitting here with Rabbi Menachem Nissel. Hi, all the everyone. Way from Eretz Yisrael, you just landed like an hour ago, no? Exactly. Yeah, wow. it's crazy. And you look, you don't look tired at all. Um, I, I'm faking it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> But I'm you're exhausted beyond belief. But you're not originally from Eretz Yisrael. No, I'm 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 British. <laughs> Don't hold it I against me. I hear that in the accent. Is yeah. either is either you're British yeah, or we you're made from 34 Flatbush. seconds in I, where we didn't know. I yet. am <laughs> I'm a Brit, but my my accent is mid Atlantic because I spent a few years in Memphis, Tennessee, and I started speaking like this. It sure is nice to see y'all, and then I just became this mix right. of British and American. Okay, so oh, I guess your accent's a little bit different than the typical I'm British accent. I'm culturally British, if that's okay. what you want. So yeah. we're going we're gonna to delve into what you're up to now, but your upbringing wasn't the same lifestyle as you currently have. Is to that accurate? Put it very mild, <laughs> to put it mildly, yeah, I grew up, uh, today it would be labeled modern orthodox, mm -hmm. uh, but it was a different kind of a vibe than it was today. It's kind of like... It's a little crazier. Back then, um, I had like a little kippah I had longish hair, but not like longish, longish hair. And it was perfectly acceptable to go to, let's say, a rock concert on Mati Shabbos, which and then was Saturday night. And then Sunday morning, I'd be with the Gemara open. Hmm. It was sort of like seamless for us to be able to be from and to enjoy the party world at the same time. What type of, I'm so curious, uh, you could share, you don't have to share, what type of rock concerts were you? So um, th that was the time, I don't want to, <laughs> it's that crazy, I'm starting off with this, but the music was really good in those days. I know you're probably too young to have heard of like Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd. Arco was born in like 2003, I think, right? <laughs> Okay, yeah, this, these people are all like, like the Who have changed the name to the, I beg your pardon, because they're just a bunch of alter cockers today. So it's, it's not the same, but back then it was just, it was a great time. If you were going to be listening to non-Jewish music, <clears throat> any of my students should not be listening to me. If you are <laughs> going to be listening to stuff, at least listen to the good stuff. So, so you started becoming more religious over time? No. Did it happen in a moment? No, I flipped out. You flipped out? Yeah. At the end of my first year of yeshiva, um, my rabbi, Rebbe Vrom Gorowitz, he should be well and healthy, said to me, um, Menachem, I'm not going to make you black, but going to make you charcoal gray. And he did a good job. Mm. That was it. One year became two years. Uh, three years was World War Three. And uh, you want to hear the whole story? Yeah. Let's do it. Let's <laughs> delve right in. That's why we're here. <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, ooh, take a deep breath. Okay. Post-COVID deep breath. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you the story. Um, um, from 16 to 18, I went through um, what I call today my idiot years. So the thing is, is that um, my parents were pretty um, open. They, they didn't ask where I went and who I went with. Uh, but from 16 to 18, I took that to the extreme. I took advantage and a lot of things that I regret uh, looking back. And please don't ask me for details. I'm just asking you sure, sure, just sure. to trust me. <laughs> um, just to my wife's credit, when I dated her, um, I said to her, you know, do you want to ask me about, about the idiot years? And she said to me, as far as I know, I'm marrying, if I marry you, a talent of Ramos Shapiro. Mm -hmm. And um, the idiots do not interest me. And it's now 
Diana Hara, 30 something, something, something years. Mm. <laughs> I hope no, my wife is not listening now, but it's 30. Yeah, I know. My son is 36. So it's 37 years. Wow. 37 years. You look way younger. She has not once asked me about anything I did in my teens. She could not care less. And um, when that period ended, so plan A was that I was supposed to go for one year to yeshiva. Um, originally, it was supposed to be a choice between Gush Etzion and KBY. And I was supposed to go afterwards to medical school, which was basically my father's dream and sort of my dream. And um, I, I, was, I was into it, I'm not going to lie. And uh, I ended up going to a yeshiva called Itri, which was a black hat yeshiva. And uh, this was a process that I thought was going to be temporary. <laughs> My rabbi told me that your kippah must be black. He gave us the whole racket, including hat and jacket. That was my first perm spiel. Mm -hmm. I was a lonely teenage, bronc and buck, didn't care much for cautious and such. But I knew that I wasn't locked the day my rebbe came. And we were singing bye-bye to girls and B.A. B.A. was B'nai Akiva. Mm. Come to Itch Yerushalayim and learn Torah all day. And then good old Bachrim pushed us out the way, singing this must be the true Torah. Wait, you get the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I came to Israel, um, and Rabbi Ram Goritz made me do, which was really inside of me all the time. Because as I said, even in the dumbest moments of my life, I still loved I still loved Hashem. I still loved Gemara. Gemara was always my passion. And uh, I still loved going to shul. It was, not, it was never a problem with me. Uh, Hashem was not the problem. It was just too much fun to be had. Mm -hmm. So at the end of one yeshiva, my parents gladly gave me a second year. When I say my parents, it was really my father. At the end of my second year, it was awkward because the medical school would no longer defer. So my third year was a compromise. Brokered by my uncle that I would take an American degree and a uh, bachelor's. And with that, I would be able to go to um, and take a master's in business. <clears throat> so um, I promised my dad, I gave my word of honor that it would just be one more year, um, maybe two more years, depending how long it takes for me to get the master's. And then it ended up being two years to get my bachelor's, excuse me. And after that, I was going to go back to London University, he said, after you get your college degree, you can do what you want. Mm. I've done my responsibility, my father said, of making sure my son has a parnasa. After that, you can do what you want. So I really, really had an amazing two years. My third and fourth year was when I became a talent of Ramon Shapiro. Um, he came into my life. Um, maybe later on I could talk more about him sure. Sure. and how he impacted me. But he really finished off the job. The Rebbe Ram Gorets began and turned us into B'nai Torah, but very sophisticated. I was, I was in love with his mahalach and his approach. Uh, he became um, my other father. I had my dad and I had my spiritual father who was giving me an incredible mahalach in life. And, um, and I was young and I still had that crazy inside of me. And at my Pesach of my fourth year, I decided... I'm not going to go to university. Um, it's a little embarrassing. The main reason was not so much that I was against university studies. I actually thought it was, it was not a big deal to get a university degree. I actually was for that. I did not want to go back to London and take a masses with, um, with non-Jewish men and females and go back into an environment where I knew that I would fall. But you had a deal with your father. I had a deal with my dad. So it, this was awkward. So I went home for Pesach, and um, I did uh, stupid things, as was my want. I had a relapse. I bought myself a ticket back home, uh, back to Israel, against my father's wishes, because he had asked me, you know, this is it, Pesach, you're staying the last month. He got me a job and everything. And just to give you the dynamics of my relationship with my dad, I told my father, I says, uh, Dad, I don't know how to say this to you, but I'm, uh, I'm running away from home. <laughs> And I kind of need you to take me to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. So I got my old man. God bless him. He took me to the airport. And my father is, uh, just to give you some background, he was a, he's a Romanian Jew. Um, he was the only hero I had ever known. Like he was saving Jewish lives during, during the Holocaust in Romania, including the Baba Rebbe. 
that was, and I actually just saw the Santa Rebbe when I was in Miami, and uh, it was his brother as well, saved by my father and his brothers. Uh, my dad fought in 48 and 56. Wow. Um, my dad was a big man, but he had this tough streak in him. Um, it came from the idea of Yashras, responsibility. That was what was all about. And he said to me, uh, Menachem, he didn't call me Menachem then, he called me Manny. He said, Menachem, he said, you, um, you, you, you broke your word. And um, 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 I, I don't forgive you. And if you get on that plane, I'm not stopping you, but you're going to have to be on your own. I don't want to have any contact with, with, with Ima, no contact with uncles and aunts and, and siblings. Um, until you come back, I don't want to hear from you. And my father meant business, and uh, I was sort of mortified. I got off the plane. I, get, I still get the shivers, and I think about that period of my life. It was really, really insane. I did not know how to deal with it except for one way, which was to immerse myself in learning. Remember, I had no money because I had no income whatsoever. I stayed in the base of Medrash. I didn't go away for Shabbos. Um, in those days, myself and my chevra, my friends, some of you, some of you know Rabbi Mordechai Becher. Mm-hmm. Or, or some of you may know Rabbi Short Karsh from Chicago. Those were my, 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 my apartment mates. My, these are people, I was very close to them. We were doing you know, 14, 15 hours a day of learning, maybe even 16 hours. We were really pushing it, really pushing ourselves to do the maximum. And um, I was loving my learning, but there was this aching feeling inside of me that I was doing something wrong. It's just not right to not be in touch with your mother, not to be in touch with your father, with your family. Um, terror learning is one thing. It's chashuv, but I knew that it was wrong. I did not know how to deal with it. And then I did something kind of radical. I said, I'm going to take it to the Godel Hadar. So in those days, there was a bunch of them. But the easiest to have access to was Rebel Yashiv. Um, Rebel Yashiv, hey, it was just just a few minutes you're in. Uh, Rebel Yashiv, I knew how he works. He basically, he's looking at his farm the whole time. When you come, when you start talking, he looks up and listens to you. If you pause, he's back in the farm. He'll answer you in two or three minutes. It's very clear. He has Ruach HaKodesh, like the Holy Spirit. He's, he's got everything, absolute clarity. And whatever comes out of his mouth, that's what I was going to do. So I go in there. I pour my heart to, heart to me, out to him, and he says to me, I think you should listen to your father. I think you should go back and you should take that degree and then come back afterwards to Eretz Yisrael. But, but, it's always a but. Yeah. you should go back married. <laughs> this is what he said. You should go back married. In other words, I told him about my Yitzhahar issues and, and I wasn't really... You should go back married. So I said, um, We're talking about four more months, and you want me to be married. So he put on his beautiful Rebel Yasha smile, and he took my hand, and he said, This is Jerusalem, the holy city. Things work differently here. <laughs> and then he said the words, in Hebrew, of course, he said, Don't worry. Everything is going to be okay. Really? English? In Hebrew. Oh. <laughs> no, he's quoting it in... <laughs> I, I, I thought you just said that he said it in English. No, no, no he just said the, the thank you story, the toda, that's his only <laughs> English story. I was like, wow, that's crazy. That's Man. amazing. And just said it. He told me everything's going to be okay. <laughs> wow, okay. So challenge I accepted. Out, so you I said came, challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. Let's do this. I came out of there in a tizzy. I didn't know what was going on. I went back. Um, I went to the Kolel dinner table, all the Kola guys. I said, okay, I got a situation. <laughs> um, um, adult, Anglo, white, male, looking for female for purpose of marriage. <laughs> In a hurry, okay? So before I know it, the, you know, matchmaker, matchmaker, double, double, toil and trouble, all the, they were out there looking for the appropriate person and for totally the wrong reasons, I was attracted to the idea of dating a girl from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, why, you may ask. Um, for stupid reason, I had gone through a jazz phase when I was weaning <laughs> myself of non-Jewish music. 
So this was the home of the blues, Beale Street. I had this vision of Memphis being a place where randomly you see like these these handsome black guys playing saxophone at the corner of streets for no reason, <laughs> with dark sunglasses, like the whole works. So I said, I'm gonna go out. And not only that, my wife Debbie was described to me as a dancer. It was what she was, that's how she supported me. She was, a, she was a phenomenal dancer. She could dance for five, six hours without a break. And um, I said, I'm going out with Debbie Brown from Memphis, Tennessee. I dated her. Um, since it's going public, I'm not going to tell you the gory details of that Chantrin said to me, this is not going to work. I'm telling you now, you guys are incredibly different. And um, I, this is a good first date for you. But she was like this really good, solid girl. Two years in Schaffman's, now she's a madricha. And I was this, this, this clinically insane Brit who had flipped out, now Tommy Ramos Shapiro, a little bit wired up. We had eight minutes to get married. <laughs> in a it was, hurry. Like, it was like you're on a TV show. In an absolute hurry. <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure I saw a movie like that. <laughs> so she didn't even know about this. I didn't tell her the full <laughs> scoop. And um, what happened was, is that I, I did not think that this was going to work out. She was pretty sure from day one, although she'll deny it. <laughs> she was written. And after two weeks, she did a maneuver. If any ladies are listening to this, she did a maneuver that was a classic female get your guy maneuver. Um, we want to take notes, take notes. Yeah, take notes. This is in uh, th those days, it was a the Holy Land Hotel, it was like a park in front of it. And uh, she takes out from a little handbag chocolate, excuse me, peanut butter balls, chocolate covered peanut butter balls. And she said she had made them specially for me. Mm. Okay, years later. I hope you're not, you're not allergic to peanut butter, right? Oh, not at all. Okay, I think uh, <laughs> that would have been really, that would have been a real maneuver. <laughs> years later, she told me that she was lying. She was making this for a Sherry Brock because she had a few extra. Uh. <laughs> but I don't know. I took one bite. That was it. Love <laughs> was in the air. I knew this, it was over with. This it was really day. Reese's. <laughs> <laughs> you could hear the hops were coming out. Da -da 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 -da, the whole thing. This is it. This is it. This is it. I knew that she was the woman. And uh, we had been dating for a good solid two weeks. <laughs> I go back to Ramos Shapiro. I tell him what's going on. I said, um, um, I, does the rough see any reason why I shouldn't propose? He goes, no. He says, uh, I said, um, tonight Shiva Subatama is like, it's a bad time. It's a bad time to propose. He says, no, don't worry about it. I call you said it. Everything is going to be just fine. I took it to the hotel. I know exactly where we sat at the end. And I gave her my highly cheesy proposal line, which is basically the following. I said, um, I just got the go ahead from above. Now I need the go ahead from you. And then Debbie was like, uncharacteristically silent and saying, uh, are you proposing? <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, <laughs> okay, I think so. So she was overwhelmed. And uh, before we knew it, we were engaged. Oh, this was it. Just like that. Just like that. Two weeks later, we were engaged and everything was just like awesome. And everything was on track with Rebel Yasha's vision, except for one small teeny wee little problem. And that was, um, I do have parents and I do love them. Too, and they had no idea what was going on. <laughs> hmm. World War III? Is that, is, that, is that where we're headed? or More like World War Four, okay. okay? <laughs> Maybe World War Z with like zombies attacking from all directions. <laughs> I, this is it. So I had to pick up that phone. I call up. My father says, I thought we were not communicating. I says, I have news that I need to share with you. He says, what's going on? I said, um, I'm dating a girl. So he goes, oh, that's great. He's probably thinking, oh, this is the old him coming yeah. back again. He's dating girls. This is great. <laughs> you know, he's becoming normal again. <laughs> I said, no, it's, 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 it's kind of serious. He says to me, how serious? Like, serious, serious. He says, well, it's serious, serious, and you may get engaged. Uh huh. He says, wait a second, I, I'm your father, okay? Your mother and father have a right to be involved. So I said, that makes sense. Where she's from? Memphis, Tennessee. So there's silence at the other end of the phone. <laughs> I hear my dad screaming, Ima, get me the world book, letter M. This was before. 
Internet? Yeah. Wikipedia, oh, right? Wikipedia, okay, yeah. Get me the wall book, letter M. And she, I can hear them talking about us in South. Like, Who do we know in Memphis? And my father says, we got second cousins in like Denver. And maybe <laughs> they know them. And there's my European parents. My mother's German. It's okay. And so you figure out what is going on. And then my dad gets on the phone and says, wait a second. You've been dating seriously. You don't have any money. I go, yeah. That's true. Since we started dating, I spent 20 shekel on this young lady. And he said to me, you are a insult to the family name. You oh, are gosh. a shame. He says, go to your uncle Zami straight now. <laughs> go buy her a gift. And he's getting into it. And I'm seeing like dad a little bit. He's excited about this whole thing. <laughs> and he said, obviously, you're not going to make anything official until we meet her. <laughs> so we made a deal. I was going to fly with Debbie to London. And I was going to get up in London. I was going to actually get a job until the marriage. And then I would, uh, that's it. Okay, everything's in plan. And then, of course, before we get officially engaged, officially engaged, I would continue with Debbie from London to Memphis and meet my in-laws. My parents would come in, have an engagement party. Everything's going to be Did good. you make pretend that you weren't engaged? I didn't tell them that how, how, how official it was. <laughs> Unofficially Look, dating, very serious. This is, this is, by the way, pretty common that a boy and a girl have it figured out between them. Right, and they got, they right. got to get the rents involved. You know what <laughs> I mean? The parents that are listening right now are Small, looking at their kids. Teeny <laughs> wee little thing that like they they sign checks. <laughs> 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 so um, yeah, the jokes on me because like you know, it's the next generation now. So I'm marrying off my kids. Yeah. <laughs> the bottom line like, is, yeah, we got married last week. <laughs> the bottom line is the next couple of weeks. Is basically fairy tale. Right? So my Debbie comes, we arrive in London. My parents look at her and they cannot believe their muzzle because they remember the girls that I was going out with as a teenager. And these are the kind of girls that your parents say, stay away from these types. They didn't realize that I was those types as well. <laughs> but I basically was dating crazy people mm -hmm. and I was crazy and the purpose was to have fun. And suddenly there's this girl and she has that on her forehead, I am a good base Yaakov girl. I only have pure thoughts. All I care about is chesed. And that's who she was. She was goodness embodied. And she hasn't changed. That's all it is. She does not have bad thoughts. And my, 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 my parents fell in love with her. They were like so happy. Um, I flew to Memphis to meet my in-laws. Uh, Memphis was a total culture shock. I mean, here I was thinking. No saxophones yeah. on corners? Oh, no. It was like, <laughs> seriously. You ever been, Yaakov? I've never been. No, but I could imagine he probably went to his uh, call and said, like, listen, it was a good idea <laughs> first, but there's no jazz guy She started in the making more of those chocolate stuff. Like, <laughs> stop uh, thinking, start eating. <laughs> interject. Yeah, sure. <laughs> With a little story. When we, when we, when we actually d did go to Beale Street, I've never told this to anyone. We actually did go to Beale Street. Beale Street's like the home of the blues. Mm -hmm. I had to live out this fantasy. Uh, I, we went into a bar. I said, I'm Makbin Kol Isha. And uh, it was at these incredible... Well, I did have one night. My wife did not particularly care for it. She was more like into, don't you make my brown ass. But this was like... I went in there. And then um, about one hour into the jazz, were they playing... He said, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a big surprise for y'all. We have the mom of the blues and this like 80-year-old woman who had sang with like, you know, the best of the best from back in the 30s and 20s. She comes on. I said to Debbie, I'm running to the bathroom. Seriously, um, tell me when she stops singing. Because I did not want to listen to Cole Isha. Right. And um, yeah, this is kind of embarrassing. I was in this really disgusting toilet for about an hour. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, it was not good. But going back to the Memphis that I met over there was not cool at all. Mm. It's like my father-in-law, who's this southern gentleman, he says like, son, I want you all to know that Memphis is the third biggest city on the Mississippi. Mm. <laughs> so like, I go, wow, okay, <laughs> you're making London look like a hick town. <laughs> We managed like one third of the United States melon crops. I said, oh my gosh, this is like <laughs> wild stuff the going on. Crops. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, I realized you know, they, they served me tea. I was British, but it was iced tea, which yeah. is like the British equivalent of kefira. <laughs> uh, it, it was, it was not good. It was not good. But you know what? These were good people, like mm. really good people. Right. And when my parents came in, we met them. Uh, it was seriously. It was like. 
a Till the Hun uh, meets meets Prince Charming. It was they, they had nothing in common except for the fact that you had two couples that were building a beautiful family based on Torah values, and they always loved each other, even though they were very different. And um, and that was it. So so um, we arranged an engagement party. Uh, the rabbi in Memphis there was uh, there's Rabbi Ephraim Greenblatt, the great river verse Ephraim, who my father instantly loved. And we had the engagement party. <sighs> Everything was like a dream. Everything was beautiful. And that night, something very embarrassing for me happened. Um, I really, to this very day, I'm not. I'm sort of emb- embarrassed to say what happened. <sighs> After the engagement party, this is something that you guys probably know about. Grown-ups get together to talk about money. Who's paying for this? Who's paying for that? To cut a long story short, I was there. I did not realize that my father was about to give me the biggest gift of my life because he broke a deal with my father-in-law that... Um, that we shouldn't have a regular wedding. We have a teeny weeny wedding. And the amount of money he planned to spend on a big wedding, we would give to the kids to buy an apartment in Jerusalem. Whoa. My apartment now, which then costs like $60,000, um, is 10 times more now. Wow. because of what was happening that evening. And our wedding album is like, teeny weeny wedding album, because we basically had Sheva Rachas, and you know, we had a chuppah, and then dancing, and then Sheva Rachas, and it was over after two hours. And it was in the shul. And all that money saved went to our apartment. That's what my dad had arranged for it's us. It's an incredible investment. This is the best thing ever. But should, I, more, should more people do that? <laughs> um, well, COVID's kind of handling this pretty well on its own. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. But my, da- my dad always taught us, my dad, we weren't allowed to say the word money in the house. And my dad always said money is like tissue paper. Whatever I wanted, he always gave me. It was one of his principles. And we didn't want to... So it's not to proper th- to mention? like No, I, we, I didn't, no, no pocket money. Not, when he needed, he wanted. And we never asked for things. Okay. So that night, you you were you were excited about that. You weren't excited about. So that? I opened my my stupid mouth that night, and I embarrassed my father in front of my future fa- in laws. I, I I'm not gonna. I, I really it's like there's only so much I can humiliate myself, mm-hmm. and I don't know who's gonna be listening. But it Just was, a few people. Don't worry. I was I was, it was a total disaster. My father left the room, walked out. He went back to the place they were staying at, the Katz's. He went straight to sleep, fuming. Um, my mother, who, like me, is a late-night person, I went to my mother, and my mother was always silently on my side. She was just, a, just this gushy, goodness, care about everyone kind of woman. And I put my head on her shoulder, and I was crying like a baby. And I said, I said Ima, why do I do these things? Why can't Hashem close my stupid mouth? And um, she gave me a hug like mommy's not to do. And she said to me the same words as Rabbi Yashiv. She says, don't worry. Everything's going to be just fine. Everything's going to be just fine. And that was the last time that I saw my mother. The, the, the next day, my my parents were driving to the airport in in um they were going to Nashville. It was a different airport. And it was a terrible, terrible car accident. To this very day I never asked for the details. I just know that they weren't wearing seatbelts. And um my father said he was responsible for killing the woman that he loved. And over the next few days, my mother was in this hospital in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and fighting between life and death. I had already flown, not knowing about the accident when I flew that next that day. I was already in New York, and my father would not let me come to the see my mother. He refused to let me come down. He says, "Go to London," and I went back to London. And that's when I found out officially the bad news. And everything that happened next, I don't really remember. I blacked it out. Um, my best friend, one of my best friends is Rabbi Yossi Cohen. He's like a 
famous teacher today. He was there when my father met me in the airport. He's like, you know, we came to Ojisai, we hugged and we cried. And Yossi told me that my father says, this is your engagement present. And from then onwards, I have total blackout. I don't remember the Levi at all. Don't remember what happened. Don't remember what went on. I have a few memories of the Shiva. Um, I do remember the awkwardness of when someone asked me, you know, hey, Menachem, what's going on? I said, you want good news or bad news? Whatever you want. Oh, the, well, the good news is I'm engaged. <laughs> okay, okay. It, it, it's great. And hugs and everything. What's the bad news? Um, my mother just died in, in a car accident. And, um, and my world turned into darkness. And the only thing I knew what to do is what I always do, is just keep myself busy with learning and doing things. But I went to university married. And my wife, Debbie Brown from Memphis, Tennessee, took it as her project for the year to keep my father, who was in a depression, to keep my father busy, active, to not let him sink too low. She took him out, took him to movies, just kept him going. We made Shabbos with him. And she basically saved his life. She got him back to his old self. And I was doing my MBA, export management, international business. I loved it. I had my chavrusas. I, I had my first taste of teaching in the morning, which was a total disaster in Hasmonean grammar school. So would you like me to get you a real teacher? This is what those little kids would say to me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, at the end of the year, I was very successful. I was married. My life was Bashar Tova. Everything was in a good place. And I was offered a job, massive amounts of money um, in, and, and in a good firm. And I said, Debbie, I think we should, a couple of years, let's stay here, build up money, and then I can learn for the rest of my life. I can learn for years and years. Debbie says to me, that was not the deal. When we got engaged, I wanted to marry a cola guy, not a guy in, in business. I called up with Moshe Shapiro, and he said to me the following words. He said, listen to your wife, and it'll be the best thing for your father. I didn't know what he was talking about, but he was so right, because my father had become dependent on Debbie. Mm. And the moment Debbie left, soon after, Mrs. Goldstein from Memphis, Tennessee, told my father, you're not going to replace your wife. But what you can do is, is have company for, you, for, you know, for the next part of your life, just someone to talk to you. And my father did get remarried to this incredible woman. She's today the grandparent, the grandmother for, for all my kids, uh, Safta Dina. He had a, a beautiful, beautiful second marriage. And um, I went back to Eretz Yisrael. And the first thing I went to, straight to Rebel Yashiv. <laughs> like, what's going on? What is going on over here? And Rabbi Yasha put in this smile and says, I told you everything's going to be okay. I said to myself, is he not listening? My mom died in a car accident. What's going on? I went to my mashkiach, Rabbi Yashiv Zelig Rubenstein, on the way straight from Rabbi Yashiv. And Rabbi Yashiv Zelig Rubenstein, a blunt as a Brooklyn sledgehammer. He grew up right over <laughs> here. He was a hafter boy back in the 50s. Really? He would highlight. And he said, Menachem, he's a Talmud of Chatzko, Menachem, you think it's all about you? He says, everything's always to be about you. It's always got, you got to be in the center. He says, your mother had to die. We don't ask questions. The Gzir, she had to be in Shemaim. But your father had to suffer just till there. Because Baruch Hu engineered everything so that your wife should come into your father's life to be there for him. Well, recalculate. This is like crazy. And um, Baruch Hashem, I had another son and I had a daughter named after my mother. It must have been emotional. It was crazy. It was very crazy. And um, sunrise, sunset, the years rolled on. And um, I look back how 
the 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 inner strength and everything I went through in those things has so much form to who I am today. And um, Hashem has been extraordinary, extraordinary, incredibly good to me. When my father passed away on the day that he died in Charitetic Hospital, my daughter-in-law gave birth to a boy. Wow. Two floors above. And on the last day of my shiva, I went out to name my grandson after my father. And I want you to know something. My father became my biggest fan. <laughs> he was my only true group he ever had. He made me like, he would have loved this. Oh my gosh, you know, like, uh, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be a podcast. What's a podcast? <laughs> like, you know, that, that's what he was, wow. right? He used to collect the posters. He said, I had to come, I had a poster of a class. He wanted it. He wanted, he was my biggest fan. He really, it was, and we, the last years, he had so much knuckles for myself and my family. I don't know, you guys, uh, <laughs> I don't want you to have my kind of drama in your life. <laughs> but if you, if you have, when, when life goes crazy, it's good to remember that Rabbi Yashiv and people like him, Rabbi Shapiro, and my mother, Lashon, that clarity, things are going to work out. It could take a few years till you start to see this. You may not understand the details of Hashem's plans, but but Akash Baruch Hu, you know, he's he, he's there for us all the way through. We'll be right back to that amazing, incredible episode with Rabbi Nissel. But I want to say this: maybe you heard it on the episode. You will hear at a certain point. There was someone who came with Rabbi Nissel to this episode, and she said in one of her one of his talmidos. Tell me them, tell me those, tell me those. Tell me those. Um, and she literally said, she's like, I love your podcast, Meaningful People. And then what did she say, Nachi? AMR. <laughs> she really said that. And our eyes like lit up. We're like, yes, Because people. AMR is the best pharmacy in the world, yeah, the guys. Best, the you best. have a pharmacy. They're doing maybe great by you, maybe not so great, whatever it may be. Give AMR a call. Head, out, head to their website, amrfarmrx.com, or call them at 848-222-1110. Say, hey, I heard you on the Meaningful People podcast. I heard about your, about your pharmacy. I want to learn more. Um, they'll get you all set up. You won't ever worry about pharmacies. You won't, they won't be in your nightmares anymore, waiting on lines, worrying when's it going to be here. I'm making a warning, though. If you sign up and join with them, you won't want to leave them. So you're making a big, massive life change. but it's an awesome life yeah, change. It's, you know, you pharmacies, pharmacies is like marriage. You just need one. And that one should be AMR. So give them a call and enjoy the rest of this episode. You did ask for my life story. Yeah, no. <laughs> that's, okay. that's, 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 so, wow. I, I knew I knew this. We, we went into, you, Yaakov had a conversation with you on the phone and I was talking to Yaakov afterwards and Yaakov said, okay, there's a crazy life story in this one. I said, okay, what is it? He's like, no, 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 I don't want to tell you. I want you to hear it for the first time on the podcast, which happens a lot. I usually hear things for the first time. <laughs> well, that is unbelievable. I, 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 honestly, I don't like telling the story. I say it maybe once a year, mm -hmm. normally when I feel very close to people. But um, when I said last week in Arbe Siakov and Darchidina, <laughs> I said, I'm going to be on this, uh, this meaningful people podcast they all said tell your story <laughs> <laughs> they both knew about it so <laughs> <laughs> well thank you for sharing that with us that was definitely very entertaining very emotional and really inspiring uh but we want to delve into to the next chapters of your life ncsy uh life uh jew essence and and delve into that so ncsy what exactly do you do for NCSY? So, um, my twenties, I was in Colwell. Mm -hmm. I actually became very religious, like super religious. And um, Hashem, thank God, He opened my eyes that um, those crazy years, from sixteen to eighteen, I had subconsciously suppressed it. I did not want to be associated. I, mean, I was zero connection to music. Um, I knew zero what was going on in the in the pop culture. I didn't. I didn't know anything. I cut myself off. I was immersed in learning, but um, I discovered NCSY. I'm not going to go into this deeply, but there was mm -hmm. another tragedy. My wife lost a brother in Neri Sral on Purim in a car accident. An only son. My in-laws were devastated. 
Um, I went to Ramos Shapiro. I said, should we be there in Mem Memphis? For this? And he said to me, which by the way, the best advice I've ever got in my life. He said to me, Menachem, if you go now, you're going to lose everything you gained. He didn't think I was ready to go into it. And he knew. He knew my personality back to front. Don't go yet. Two years later, he said to me, Menachem, now you should go. You're ready. I went there, became a Rebbe. I found out about NCSY. I tried it. I breathed in air. This is what I've been waiting for. Hmm. I did not know how much I would enjoy this how much I would be good at this. To be honest with you, until I went to Memphis, I did not think I was going to be a teacher. I was happy to be a, to use my MBA, to do something honest, instead of going to Chinuch. <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, do a little teaching on the side maybe. But that's when I really discovered myself in Memphis, going to NCSY. And um, the first time I realized that I could, uh, I didn't know I could, I could tell a story or anything. I didn't know anything about myself. There's a whole part of myself that had been suppressed. And uh, NCSY, for me, has been the greatest gift. Akash Baruch thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Um, NCSY is a tool. It allows you access to none from kids. Um, and I think in this room, there's a young lady from... Dallas, Texas, we're not going to mention her name because she's going to kill me afterwards. <laughs> but she was my driver. What do you think I met her with a stupid cowboy hat, you know, <laughs> dumping, jam, probably dancing on the top of a table. And <laughs> it's crazy. They say, and they do so many incredible things. And they're most successful uh, with personalities like what I was 20 years ago, is people who, who are anchored the Shem Shemai, anchored in Torah. But you're going to have a little crazy. You're going to have a little Peter Pan inside of you. <laughs> And uh, that's worked out very well for me. Uh, today, I'm their senior educator. I've literally seen a whole generation come and go. Um, I've seen their numbers double and triple, and just it's just the sophistication. And it needs to go a thousand times bigger, because where we are now, within a 50 mile radius, how many teenage kids are not connected to the to Torah? Right. So Hashem gave me this gift. <clears throat> And uh, it was, uh, it was a, it's been a huge part. It's probably in terms of my career, um, after being a Gemara Rebbe, which is, as you know, okay, I taught your brother, mm -hmm. okay, Gemara Rebbe is like, that's, just, that's my anchor. That's my anchor in, in the base of Medrash as a Gemara Rebbe. But after that, that's what I consider was the career that has made me who I am. And I feel that that's my legacy, what I've given to this world. And then you moved back to Israel? After two years in Memphis. Okay. And you've been there since. Yeah. And so you mentioned to me uh, prior Jew essence. No, so Jew essence, what okay. Is that? So that's a little, I mentioned to you just because when you call me, I just come from teaching there. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, okay, I, I'm sense. very happy to give a plug for Jew essence because um, um, in the last few years, I've been working with kids from our own backyards from the film community, not professionally because it's not what I think I'm good at. It's not, I'm, I'm, it's not my, I'm much more comfortable with the NCSY thing, but because they, they pulled my heart in such a big way, and I really see these people as the biggest heroes on the planet. But what exactly? Like what exactly? Uh, these are kids from, uh, from, from, have gone through stuff. Mm -hmm. okay? I don't want to be explicit, but uh, it, it, I was actually, just when I, when I was in Miami, I was also in, in a school for those kind of kids, and uh, they've all got, you know, enough chips on their shoulders against the from world to create like a potato farm. It's, it's like we're talking about, we're talking about they've gone through stuff, really, really bad things. Ramush Shapiro once said to me, I once told him the stories of what one of my girls had gone through. And uh, he said, you know, he said, Ramush gets very emotional, very emotional. He said, I, you know, I could uh, take a, <laughs> I, I take a rope from Muncie to Flatbush and hang these people that create problems with uh, these ladies and these boys one by one if i could he just said that obviously he was in a car while i was his driver for 20 years <laughs> wow right he said this to me like in a fit of emotion i don't think it's an official quote <laughs> but when i went back and told the girl what he had said he said tell your rabbi that the rope won't be won't be long enough well 
So uh, whenever I go there, I go there to teach them, but really they give me back much more. These girls, in their blunt honesty, and they ask me questions that no one else does. And I try my best to do the only thing I do know, which is to talk about I, Haredi with a smile. That's what I am, okay? I, I, to, to show people ask me, what a shkafi you are. Yeah. So they, they used to call me Haredi with attitude, but I think Haredi with a smile, that's how I like to define myself. And to show the beauty and the smile and to show how emuna and tefillah and all these things can empower you. That's what I'm trying to give these people. Is there an answer for someone who's been to hell and back and involved in the from community and something very horribly went wrong and they were taken advantage of in, in a bad way? Like how, and they're asking you questions. What, what do you, how do you like respond to that? Well, the thing is as follows. Um, when they ask questions, it's not the same way the NCSY kids ask questions. Mm. NCSY questions says, you know, what happens after I die? What do we believe in reincarnation? Why do bad things happen? It's more like college type questions. You right. know? Here, it's not coming from the intellect, it's coming from a wrenching heart, mm. a pained heart. So there's no, and, there's no answers for Well, a... first of all, a lot of it, a lot of it comes through um, allowing them to heal. I always talk about ladders. I talk about you know, your mother's womb. So, because um, Baruch Hu gave us an angel who shows us our unique ladder. So, I don't know. Yaakov and Nachi, you could have had a ladder, I know, 50 rungs, yeah, 30 rungs. Who knows how many ladders? And we just have to get to the top of our ladders. And these kids could have ladders with, with five rungs. And Hashem says, the first rung is I want you to go through a difficult life and forgive me. I want you to be done, Mila Kafschos. And it could take 10 years for these kids to do that. And the second rung could be something like, now I want you to look around you and maybe to take all the pain you do to make the world a better place. Yesterday, I went to that place that I was talking to you about. By the way, I flew in from Miami today. I flew in from Israel on Friday. Uh. But the reason why I'm so tired <laughs> is because they kept me up last night till two and I was up oh, at six. I had to catch Bastikin uh, with wow. Samar Hasidim just to get it clear, right? But uh, when I was with those girls, so the, 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 the girl that joked to me was one of, my, one of my students. I said, you like working here? I said, yeah. I said, let me guess. You connect? I never knew her story. She says, Rabbi, yeah, of course I do. She told me she's bipolar and she told me this and what she's gone through and her parents and... I don't know what it is. These people go back and they change the next world. They change everyone else. And uh, I told her, I told this girl in the car, I said, when Mashiach comes, he's going to come soon. So uh, Mashiach's going to have a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so imagine now hundreds of thousands of you didn't want to speak to him. So you come, Menachem, this all, listen, Reb Menachem, he says, Mashiach says, I want to I talk to everyone. So just ask me one question. I mean, Mashiach gives me one question to ask. Um, this is what I'm probably going to ask him about. Mental health, right? to understand people that are going through depression and anxiety, that, that all the fallout from this COVID stuff, corona parties, these mm. people, I don't know what they're going through, but it's not pretty. Mm. To explain to you why they have to go through this, why there has to be abuse where this beautiful child is taken advantage of, life destroyed, boom. So Akush Baruch has his plan. You ask me why, I have no idea. I get Mashiach, Mashiach, I need you just to tell me what's going on. I know what he's gonna do. He's gonna say to me, step back, let's see the bigger picture. But I still don't understand that, to be <laughs> honest. I still I can preach it, but I don't get it. Right. So God willing, I, I, Mashiach, listen to Mashiach, if, you, if you're listening. <laughs> Okay. You think Mashiach yeah. is a listener for the yeah. podcast? A, I think they're subscribed. Maybe he's, he's on the podcast. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a great question. What, what's one question you would ask Mashiach? That's awesome. Oh, should we add that do to you, the list? Yeah. Do, do, you, do you think Kirov is for everybody? That everybody could be doing Kirov or it's sort of like, I mean, I think there's like a lot of talk about Kirov and there are some people who are not with the whole, there needs to be Kirov training and then there there are people who you don't need training, just go out there and inspire people where where do you stand i tell you this is a great question thank you this is great. i, I, I want to make two <laughs> is separate is it from the good convention <laughs> yeah. no like it's very good the convention style <laughs> i t i, I want to make two separate points i tell you i tell you who should not be doing care of okay this is good yeah who should Off not be doing care of mm -hmm. are people who are like have savior complexes savior I, I mean, complexes I, i'll tell you exactly okay. okay you see these young ladies and young men 
fresh out of seminary, prayer yeshiva, got to save the world. Ah, I believe in saving the world. Come on, hallelujah. And this, I've seen, I saw this with my own eyes, one girl. And uh, normally I tell the girls, if you're the type of person who's naturally intense, you should not be in care of. You'd be the kind of, you know, like you're overanalyzing, overthinking, because you, you're going to send over this like nervous vibe to the kids. Also, it might not be good for them. Like they might just like. I don't care about them. <laughs> I just don't want to mess up the kids. Okay. You understand that the number one powerful tool that we have in care is when they look at us and says, oh my gosh, you're ultra orthodox. You don't do this. You don't do that. Like the weird things that you're doing is so restrictive and you swing chickens around your head. <laughs> so you're going to tell me to become like you. But when they see that you're so obviously and so clearly happier than they are, mm -hmm. and they see that, you know, you come to your Shabbat table, Shabbos table, when they see, I wish we could have this. So um, nervous types. I once saw a girl, literally, um, um, a teen took a, 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 a NC Swire, took a non-kosher candy, put it in her mouth, and she screamed and said, that's not kosher, spit it out. <laughs> And I'm going, no, no, he's ruined everything we're doing. Like the whole thing. So <laughs> nervous types, the ones that have, you know, that's a intense type, stay away. What, what are they like? Go <laughs> and, you know, fundraise. Yeah. Okay, yeah. you want to do something for Clyde? Go and learn the DAF. Yeah, there we go. Even At oldaf.org. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was not a paid ad. Yeah, why are we not? <laughs> <laughs> we were just throwing I, it. I it's, great, it's great. It's great. I'll great reach ads. out to Moshe. It's a great ad. Um, what are the like, top three rules in care of? Wait, so, you, so wait a second. Yeah. So you asked me who else should not be doing Kira. Okay, yeah, let's I go. I just finished, then I'll give you my top three rules of Kira if you want right, that. You're getting excited, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you took on my favorite <laughs> subject. So that's it. Um, yeah, so that those one thing that should not, another thing who should be doing Kira, that is a lot of people think that um, you've got to go through training to do Kira. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge mistake. Everyone should feel that they should do Kira because I'm not going to bore with you, bore you with this, but I can give you my class of 10 Torah commandments about why you should care about your fellow Jew to be makar of them. And uh, it's, it's an obligation. A Jew should always look around and say, as another Jew, it's not religious, ask yourself, maybe I can say something, teeny weeny thing to makar of them. Um, to be honest, uh, I have a certain, um, I, I know a certain it, new word, very trendy, triggering. <laughs> yeah. All my students are saying I'm triggered by this. I get triggered by the word professional care person. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just I don't. So like you're the part word. of that camp. Yeah. I, just, oh, I got I, you. I, I don't really really like the word professional. I think I don't mind if you get paid for doing what you do. I like the word trigger though. I think like there's trigger warnings in everything. Yeah, this is good <laughs> Laffy taffy, words. trigger warning. You know, it's like, like it's like Billy Idol saying like duh. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's it's one of those words. It's just like it just comes in, yeah. and then if you gotta know what they're saying, so um. So, um, yeah, it gets triggered, this thing about professionals and the whole thing. And so you don't like I, professional I, Kirov? I can't stand, um, I work with them. I work for Nella LF, which is Kirov training. Right. And some of my colleagues say, when they ask this question, you answer that. No, that's do like not listen answer, to that. That's like the opposite. Like yeah. you're, you're saying be chilled and you have to be yourself. And, and just say, I don't know, that's a good question. Let's go ask someone. There's no playbook, it sounds like you're yeah, saying. Yeah, the it's... whole thing is that, that the people that are most successful are the ones that really are the shame shemaim. They really care. And, they, and their personality, it's just got like, yeah, you want to get close to these people. These people are such nice people. You don't have to be cool. You can be nerdy because they, you know, little nerds yeah. attract each other. And the nerds marry the nerdettes and have little nerdlings. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all good. You know, Clyde still yeah. needs that too. Someone sure, has to be sure. an accountant. So yeah. there's there, I, there's so many more <laughs> topics that we do want to talk to you about. So uh, I, I want to ask you a question because I know it's going to lead into another topic. What is your favorite mitzvah? Um, I have a bias. I wrote a book in Tefillah. <laughs> Which is about to come. This is a public service announcement. <laughs> it's about to come out with its second edition, written by my oldest son, Rick Shalev. We went into that changed my life. Rick Shalev. Yeah, I just so there's no question about it. When I was um, when I first started teaching, so Rabbi Shafin said, "We just lost our tefillah teacher. I heard you speak once at the Shabbat Brachas. Could you fill in from eight to nine before Kolel and about tefillah? I said nothing about tefillah. I got into the topic." I started realizing that no one was writing about the halachas of tefillah for women. 
Mm-hmm. I wrote a book about it, Rikshi Lave. It's kind of a second edition. Where is it? Where are people going to be able to buy that book? Maybe Feldheim. Feldheim. Uh, yeah, but the, it's going to be, you know, there's everything in Hashkafa and Halacha that women need to know. But while I was doing that, my davening had a evolution and then a revolution. And I noticed that when I was teaching, it got better. Over the summers, it would go down a bit, back to teach. And now, Baruch Hashem, I more or less have it pat. But um, I have become, for myself, tefillah is my anchor to sanity. I feel comfortable talking to Hashem as much as much as I can find time for. And um, the, the, the girls and the boys, when yeah. they come to me, say, I'm going through this funk, that funk. I always ask them, how's your davening? They know this. Because I'm saying, you're trying to deal with this without bringing Hashem into the equation. You're not going to win. you got to become a davener. So, so that's my mitzvah. And that is a gift Hashem gave me for myself and I try and share it with others. And um, for someone who's, who is davening or struggling with davening, I think I think everyone falls on the category but of even like, like, at point struggling with davening. Yeah, and I, I think also like or connecting to, to, to go with where, what you're going to say, I think is like, especially after the COVID world, right. there was like a, there's like a, especially I guess we're, we're, in, we're in New York. So there was a big stretch of period of time where you weren't allowed to go to a shul or right, it was no like minion. awkward. Like are people davening in a minion? Are you not davening a minion? It was like, it became political to not to. I, I think that there perhaps are people who are just, you know, either not davening or davening themselves, even when there are many them happening, just because of the, they got caught into that funk during COVID. Um, right. How did, I guess you could finish your question about no, reigniting. I, was, I go to Minion three times a day, but it sounds like now nah, he doesn't. But no, no, but I was like, I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, no, but like, I think just throughout our lives, whenever it is, yeah. we're always certain points where people struggle with davening or they get a little better. Like someone who's struggling with it, like what could they do? Whether, whatever their struggle is. Whether... I, I would like to replace the word davening okay. with the words relationship with Hashem. Mm. And davening is just the way we do it. Okay. Um, I I think that because Baruch is genius. Whatever he's doing with this Corona, I have, I just came from South Florida, so I'm into this Latino okay. hip hop. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> Corona party, like all things. So, uh, COVID nineteen is so pompous. COVID nineteen, jolly good show, dare mm. say. But I just wanted to say, I don't know what he's doing, but this has shaken up the whole world of tefillah because people think yeah, tefillah equals going to shul three times a day. Wrong. It never was that way. What are we, Parshas, uh, what is it, Parshas Vayetze now? Mm-hmm. Yaakov Avinu unleashes the power of Mariv on his own in the middle of darkness, being chased by Esav. And that's how the first Mariv began. No minion. It wasn't like, oh, okay, <laughs> Santa. That wasn't it. He was just, the tefillah is very deep. Mm-hmm. It's very personalized. Every single person should ask themselves, what gives me anxiety? And everyone has anxiety. No offense, Yaakov. You look cool, calm. Oh, I totally. Especially us. I totally. <laughs> no, we got Dr. Benji on just to talk to me. We had, <laughs> we had a mindfulness podcast here. That was the best 20 minutes of our lives. It's crazy, isn't it? It's yeah. crazy. Everyone has, you know why we all have anxiety? It's 2020, that's why. Hashem <laughs> wants to keep us close. Mm. That's it. Okay. Hashem's saying, Kendalach, okay, that's it. So, so uh, yeah, Yaakov meets Rachel. She can't have kids. What's with that? Hashem wants her tefillah. It's not Hashem wants that extreme closeness that comes through tefillah. So, so, so this, this, this coronavirus thing. In Israel, we never stopped davening. We just turned it underground. It was yeah. the <laughs> and the repesets and everything. But over here, here you really were forced to say, okay, Revolver, who was my other Rebbe, for 20 years I went to his vod and was very close to Revolver, not like Ramosha, but Revolver used to say, you don't really know if you're a davener until you daven on your own. That's when you find out your power to feel. How do you daven a Shwanesu when no one's watching you? Isn't he in the room? So um, a friend of mine here, I'm not going to say his name for a reason, he once walked into Ramosha Shapiro when he was davening alone while his daughter was, was dying from cancer. And he walked in, and um, he watched Rav Moshe Shapiro davening Rafa'inu, just the Brach Rafa'inu, he was singing a little bit loud. It took him 20 minutes. Whoa. And he kept on saying, like, in, 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 while he was talking in Yiddish, but she's your daughter as well, like, in a, in a, talking about for davening. And he said the whole tefillah took an hour and a half, a Shmona Esrei, a Mincha Shmona Esrei, because no one was watching him. No one was watching him. It's just him and the Kurdish Baruch Hu. 
this whole last year and a half, this whole year, excuse me, with, with Corona, yeah. it's forced us to become more, more involved in Panemius and to become real. I just spoke now to the NCSY staff in Miami. That was my message. Okay, no longer staying at the table at Shabbaton, getting people to become from, no. You take one kid, learn with him one-on-one, -on -one, have meaningful conversations. It's a much more, it's less glamorous, but it's much more deeper. That's the world of tefillah. So, um, and that's why, of course, why women are so good at davening, because they, they don't need the crutch of the synagogue. For you and for me, a shul is not a crutch. It's, it's, it's an addition. Never thought about that. It's an addition. It makes davening... Uh, more like the base of Migdash. But the base of Migdash wasn't the only place of Tefillah. Mm. People dumbed in the field. So the point is, is that, so Hashem wants us to go back to our shuls and to dumb with the same reality and, 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 and intensity. Going back to the word anxiety, right? Yeah. The, the anxiety that you have, you'll be too embarrassed to tell your own spouse. Why? Because a lot of things, that, the jealousies that we have are so petty the things that bother us, so, you know, whatever it is, I, I wish I could have, you, know, you look at your body and you say, I wish I could fix this and change that and every, oh, little things. Well, guess what? Hashem does not want a relationship with a fictitious you. He wants a relationship with you, mm. with all your stupidity. So if you're a, if you're a, um, a 13 year old girl and your life is like in the inside of a Spanish telenovela. <laughs> Whatever it is. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but that's great. <laughs> Canarifka, why did you leave me for Rochele? Like, no, right. If that's how you are, Shem wants to hear about it because he wants a relationship with you. So that's how tefillah works. And I think that's like, that's it. It's something that is the foundation. With that, you get to Emuna. With that, you start to notice how much Hashem is in our lives. With that, you see that your life is an incredible string of miracles. Do you have a specific tefillah, like uh, that when you get up to that in davening, you know, it, it's your favorite part of the day? Wow. <laughs> okay, this is, this is embarrassing. Um, Everyone's, no, got, everyone's got like a Pasuk or like a, a you know, well, a line. I, I'm, no? I'm supposed to, i tell you what I'm supposed to answer. Okay, we'll do the, what you're supposed to <laughs> and, and what and the real answer is. I'll tell you what the real is. Okay. I'm supposed to answer. Says, you know, like, it's like saying, what's your favorite ice cream? It depends on your mood, right? Okay. So, so one day I'm into like, you know, like I can eat, I can, I can go for like cherry. Oh my gosh, strawberry. But most times, okay, so you just stick with the, with like vanilla with little chocolate bits in it. Mm -hmm. stuff. Same thing with davening. So everything's got a different flavor to it. The Shema does its thing, morning brachas. But you ask me where I personally find most intensity, no one's asked me this before, not even my wife, it's definitely modim. Mm. Oh, I wrote a class on every part of the Shema Nasri. I've given that modim, I don't know, al nisecha shivachol yom, val niflo secha every single day. I stop before val nisecha shivachol yom. And I go through my day and I ask myself, what happened today that was a miracle? And I always find. It's like, it's just insane. Today there's been a whole bunch. Yeah. There's like, like crazy stuff. Well, this is one of them. Like, I, I, I'm one of them, look at me. I'm a <laughs> meaningful, whatever this is called. Meaningful. <laughs> I'm a meaningful something. I don't know what it was. Just meaningful. Meaningful. Okay. <laughs> I think Bender called us but, meaningful moments. Yeah, I can tell not? you what it is. I, t I tell you what was the, the low point of this day, it was the lady behind me who is not going to mention her name. She evilly took out and says, you know, I brought you lunch, which is, that's fine. I don't mind being fed. <laughs> and it was this huge, big donut filled with like sweet cheese. Where was it from? <laughs> oh, I've heard, oh, of that. Wow. I've heard of that. Okay, so yeah. what? Hey, that donut's not cheap. That's, what like, can I, what that's can, probably like a $15 donut. What can I tell <laughs> you? <laughs> yeah. Anything, yeah. But the point I want to make is, is that, is that, um, that, that's it. You, 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 you forces mm -hmm. you to be self-aware of your life and Hashem. And then when I say niflo secha secha I try every day to look at something new in Hashem's world that I've always taken for granted and never noticed. Right now, I could look around here and say, oh my gosh, there's so much awesome technology happening right here that I don't even understand. Why are there two cameras? Three. <laughs> three. <laughs> there three. Okay, I'm getting creeped out. There's three cameras on me now. It's probably more that we don't know okay. about. Facebook, Google, you know, <laughs> <laughs> who knows? So, uh, so little things, little things. That, yeah. When's the last time I thanked Hashem for this awesome fan that's going on behind me? Thank you, Hashem, for, for yeah, water in a plastic cup. Yeah. Oh my gosh, 
Dolby Tomaszewski, where I'm staying at, she gave me that last HS just now. There's, there's so many things. We just take these things for granted. Hodel Hashem Kitov. So, Modem, yeah, th- I've never been asked that before. Thank you. I heard, a nice, I heard, I heard a nice a nice art from Rabbi Menachem Penner. He said that before you start Shemana Esrei, he says, he, he talks to Hashem and he says, Hashem, it's, it's Menachem. It's just me. It's Menachem. He says, like, he says his name and right. he gets him into a mode of he's just speaking to his father. It's beautiful. Yeah, I thought so too. Beautiful. <laughs> and I, I, you're a man of, of many hats, black hats, baseball caps, whatever it is. Uh, I'm British, do you know baseball caps? Oh, sorry. So uh, <laughs> those 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 furry hats that they wear by the, <laughs> yeah. the, by the queens. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so another one of your hats is you go to Europe and you go on those tours. Yeah. Used to? <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. You, are you still going? I, I, to be honest with you, today I'm supposed to be in Dubai Whoa. Um, with... Eli Slamowitz, ENS tools. Um, I wrote the brochure. I am the number one Haredi expert in the United Arab Emirates at this moment. <laughs> I can tell you all the statistics about Dubai and their history, and I can talk to you now for a solid hour uh, on the Jewish content of that part, including that my oldest son said Dubai. It comes with the word doiv, which is the animal that represents the uh, Persia and uh, crazy stuff. Oh. That's pretty cool. So, so you're supposed to be there right now. Yeah. So I just tell you. But you wanted to be on the podcast, so you push that off. <laughs> I wanted to be at my sister's wedding tomorrow. Oh. Oh, Molotov. Molotov. You, you know, know you know Folly Tesla. You know, we live in Harborview. Oh, no, I do. That's my sister's oldest son. He's getting married. Wow. That's why you're here, I'm guessing. Right, you took about miracles. My oldest, my, my nephew, Leon Hara, he's been dating for a lot of years and he's gone all over the world and he ended up Finding the goal, a block down. Really? really? So awesome. Awesome. Yeah, it's that's beautiful. Classic. We're very excited tomorrow. That's so nice. But that's why I'm here. And then because of that, I'm, I missed out. i tell you something. Um, Hashem, it's a mixture. Of, I think Hashem's British. What? <laughs> yeah, because No, he's, no it, way. Not, not going to give that up. Oh, then. yeah. yeah I, I, he's, the Canadians he's, think he's Canadian, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Canadians think I, he's Canadian. He has a terrific sense of humor. It's slightly twisted. I mean, it should, <laughs> I probably just lost my own harbor for saying that. <laughs> but I, yeah, but like, he has perfect teeth. He pursed it. Yeah, just, there we go. Okay. Fritz on our perfect teeth, right? <laughs> Things I didn't think we're talking about. Hashem's teeth on this episode. <laughs> okay, listen. I feel now. like we're going to hate mail. Like, Hashem's teeth. Hashem doesn't have teeth. It says in my first. Right, right, you're right, going to so. hate mail from the Brits uh, listening to you. So, yeah. so why do you think Hashem's British? Okay, it was just, just, first, it just the way he runs as well. It was genius, okay? Classy. And uh, with a little twist of humor. So I happened to be, when I was a kid, uh, my father's job was travel. Um, I was a geography and a history buff. Um, history buff became a Jewish history buff. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to be saying this in front of a microphone, but uh, they say you can tell who the person really is by his bathroom reading. <laughs> by the uh, 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 that's the way to go. So that history, geography, stuff like that. And um, and uh, one day I realized, I guess somewhere in um, my late 30s, <clears throat> that I'm in Chinuch. Um, it's not exactly, I want to take my wife to see something pretty. So you can take it to the Golan, and you can take it to the Golan, right, and the Canera, and that's yeah. it. But it's not as much you can do. And one day, um, um, it was uh, this, this wonderful lady from Chicago, Miriam Schreiber. She called me up and she said to me, do you know anyone, do you know anyone that can do, like, lead a tour in Spain, <laughs> right, in Gibraltar and Morocco? Um, so what kind of money are you paying? She, she told me. I said, hey, that kind of money, you know, I think uh, I think you got <laughs> I'll find somebody. You, I'll find you someone. Okay, I'll okay. go to the moon if you need me. <laughs> there we go. So, But you know what it is? I, I, I found out how nice was Hashem because now I'm doing the most incredible fun things. And I'm just embarrassed to say this, but last year I took my wife to Sicily. Yeah, be jealous. Mm-hmm. It's gorgeous. <laughs> to Panama. Okay, that was just and just. That's Great awesome. thing. We just traveled the world. Five star hotels, hang out with the most wonderful people. Um, um, I'm not a historian in like the, 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 the our real master historians, but I'm a historian um, just because I know a lot about things just in general. Mm-hmm. And um, it's like, it's not what I, I'm not a historian. Okay, I'm a mechanic. I'm a rebbe. So my style of teaching is something that people enjoy. Mm. I take, I'll take whatever it may be, something to see, Sally. Okay, so I'll, I'll find out who, which were born and were there, and then somehow I'll connect it to our lives. What can we learn from them that connects to us? So it's not just bones. I give the material 
flesh and blood and I breathe air into it and turn it into Torah. So that's what I do. So I, I have the greatest time, spend time with my wife, fancy vacation, five star. Sign I me up. Let's do this. Double yeah. my size and weight. <laughs> I mean, this is like, yeah, I'm not going to lie to you. Okay. Thank you, Ian Estors. You know, this is, <laughs> this is the way it goes. Do you have a favorite moment from all of the places in Europe and around the world that you've been in? It's like my ice cream question. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of those, a lot of moments. So Maidem is the answer? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 just, I, I just, listen, um, I really believe that the Rambam says, okay, so the first step to discovering Kodesh Baruch is by seeing the beauty of his world. So nature is something beyond. I, right. I was in South Africa last year, but I go, also I go as a Rebbe, I go as a teacher. NCSY has sent me to places. I mean, my gosh, I've been, I've been arrested in four continents. I'm talking about small violations. Um, Can we but, talk about that? <laughs> You've been like, what? Why, why were you arrested? I'm going to think of something kosher. I'll tell you something kosher. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'll tell you two stories just so you understand what I go through. In Italy, so I was there with NCSY kids. So we got the Arch to Triumph, and I have my Ponovitcher of moment, you know, mm -hmm. Titus, Titus, right. we're still here, yeah. that whole thing there. And then we start seeing Am Yisrael Chai. And it's like 30, 40 of us. And then this group, this, uh, this um, a French group of teenagers joined us. And then there's always Americans, right? So the Americans yeah. joined. Before I knew it, something, oh, God, well, the police are coming <laughs> down. <laughs> Who is in charge of the thing? It's an illegal demonstration under the Arch of the Triumph. And they all point to me like Nissel. Uh, <laughs> they cuffed you? Like... No, they did not cuff me, but they took me into a police van. Oh, wow. And all the kids were dominating for me. And like, seriously, <laughs> they thought it was the funniest thing did ever. You, did you like that moment or... At the moment, no, but the great... Yeah, I, had who, yeah, I love getting not, arrested. I had no, story. because like, he you're was not actually, doing any, he, you're honestly not doing anything yeah, wrong. Yeah, but he was sober. He didn't enjoy getting arrested. Honestly, you weren't sober. But anyway. after what you're like, this is I'll a great story. I'll, I'll tell you what was crazy, what was super crazy. I, had a, I, I, I teach Panamanians. Um, I had an That's almost what you call I, them. I, 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 <laughs> Chileans as well, very similar story. In, in Chile, if you get in trouble with the police, they put you on a helicopter, they take you over to the Pacific, and you become the desperaciados. Okay, that's what happens to you. So um, I actually just came down from Miami. Um, There's an incredible family, Chaim and Judy Herman. So they're like my, this is my happy place in Miami, so I go to stay. Um, now I have a son living there. He oh, so works nice. with Israelis, but that's a different story. Um, and um, I'm going there, coming from Panama. Coming from Panama. So... Um, <laughs> So my wife calls up Judy and says, what would you like my, my husband to bring you? So she goes, I hear that they have like in Israel pre-checked spelt flour. <laughs> so my sweet wife takes these little small Ziploc bags, fills them with this white powder. Oh, gosh. And she packs my suitcase. She put them, layers them underneath at the bottom of the suitcase. <laughs> Listen, the pure thoughts can't, you know? That's, that's the negative part. The pure thoughts won't say, you know what? This looks like cocaine. <laughs> this was not funny. Because uh, you should know, I was there with one of my students. I told her what was going on. We're about to go out. We're about to go out. And she goes, Rabino, you are on your own. I do not know you. <laughs> okay, there we talk about, about student loyalty. Yeah. And in the end, Baruch Hashem, okay, it was like, it was not pretty, but, uh, but okay, but these are like, those are fun moments I've had where I wasn't doing things that I can't say in front of my kids. <laughs> if, uh, if you can go back in history and spend an hour with someone who isn't alive anymore, just talk to them, who would it be? That's an easy one. Billum's donkey. <laughs> I'm not gonna <laughs> lie to you. Billum's he's my hero. I don't know what it is. <laughs> and there's Billum's donkey's like, yeah, well, he's my brother. <laughs> he's got like he comes along. How awesome. He opens his mouth and out comes Torah. Like that's how I feel every time I walk into a place. Hashem, <laughs> open up the mouth of the donkey. We can do this together. What will you speak to him about? I don't know, but just like his technique, I just think he's so cool. You just want a selfie with him and then call it a day. <laughs> I don't know. He's one of my favorite characters. Like, there's, there's a lot of people out there. But um, to, today, he asked me today, it's like going back to the ice cream question. Yeah, today. I'm about to speak tonight at the Tomaszewski's about Yitzhak Avinu. Yitzhak Avinu is my Jew essence girl. Uh, he's the least understood of all the Avos. 
um, the way it generally works is you probably get like, you know, the men always say things like, Avram Avino, Yaakov, and the girls say, Yosef, <laughs> he was so handsome. <laughs> oh, David Amach, he had pretty eyes. Okay. But the thing is, no, to be honest with you, Yitzhak Avino is the Av that is the Av for our generation, what we're going through now. So he did care through Tefillah, and his essential nature was to care for people that were hurting. Um, why? And you're just going to have to hear my class tonight. This is going to be, it's a whole big deal. Yitzhak is a gematria Hagar for a reason. They're both 208. And Hagar was the one that found God when she became the first girl in history to be kicked out of seminary. It's pretty classy to be kicked out of Benosara. But she did. Mm. Okay. And she went down to Crack Square. It's called the Midbar. And here you have this Egyptian princess. She was the kardashian back then you know what i mean whatever it is the and she comes out and she reaches the top hits the bottom and she finds god when everyone else had given up on her she finds hashem and she says hashem you take care of me when no one else wants to i did not know that hashem takes care of the lowest of the lowest and yitzchak takes that tefillah and that is the foundation block of our tefillah mincha when the sun is setting. All of us have those moments in life when we feel the sun is setting and we feel we're losing control and all our dreams and aspirations from the morning are disappearing like the sunset. And uh, Yitzhak takes that moment and says, we're not giving up on you. We're not letting you f lose it. And he anchors that moment back into his father Avraham, which was the world of hope. So I'm into Yitzchak for today. Mm -hmm. so let me ask you a question. This could be maybe too personal, but if, if you could speak to your mother, what would what would you talk to her about? <sighs> I only knew my mother as a teen. I, I never ever listened to her when she told me about Kristallnacht, watching her shul being destroyed. I never listened to her about the stories that she saw in the 30s. I never bothered to really understand where she came from. I never asked her. She told so many stories about the Blitz. They got out one month in London and... Uh, her parents took in dozens of all these refugees, kinder transport children. And when I think of my mother, she took care of the of the of the people that everyone else didn't care about. My father used to talk about Charlie's Angels, not what you're thinking. <laughs> Mrs. Sullivan, actually I'm not gonna say their names. Two of them were born in 1900. One was born in 1899. Ah, you're from the last century, okay? They had lost everything. And um, my mother was there for them. Uncle Shalom, he wasn't an uncle. Lived on his own, taxi driver. When he died, he, his last will was, Mrs. Nissel should take care of me. And he died the same day that my mother died in that car accident. And the police came to my house, Nine Woodlands Close in London. So all the neighbors thought it was about the, my mother's accident. No, they were looking for my mother to take care of Uncle Shalom. I never understood where she got it from. I never understood how she worked. She had zero interest in anything except for taking care of people that no one else cared for. And... Um, I would like her to talk, just to talk about herself. And I'd like to get to know a little bit better. <sighs> and just to hear those stories again. That's a beautiful answer. But uh, something that you mentioned to me um, in our conversation prior was that you said that y you, there's something that's an oxygen for you, and it's privacy. What do you mean by that? Because you seem like a very... Extra, out there yeah. yeah you're very out there you're, you're always with people what yeah. what do you mean that you need your privacy in what way i i i am um, i crave aloneness 
Um, I crave space. Um, my loneliness is on two levels. One is the base of Medrash and my family the, and no one else. Just I need time with my family, my wife, my children, <coughs> um, and the base of Medrash with the Chavrusa. That's that's the thing. But then I also I also I also um, um, a little bit. You become when you become a public person, you become larger than life. You do a thing, whatever it is the theater or stuff like that. You're always dealing with people, moving back and forth, and then I just need to get back and uh, remember that I'm a Talmud of Rambam Shapiro and Revolva, and uh, and uh, get in touch with myself. I love hiking on my own. Mm. On Sunday, I took the kids to the Everglades. Mm-hmm. Last time I was in the Everglades, I just drove in. I found myself an alligator. I stared at it for 20 minutes until I got Ruach HaKodesh. <laughs> You're laughing, right? Yeah. I'm a little exaggerating. Yeah, okay. But it, until I get that feeling, that inner rush, that I'm, I'm reconnecting to my inner world. Until you start feeling that, you know, the alligator, like, yeah, he's talking to you. <laughs> I need that. I need that. Was that's what happened? That I mean, well, last year when I was in with the penguins in Boulder's Beach in Cape Town. So my, the friend says, "Rabbi, how long do you need?" I said, "As long as it takes." Let's go away. <laughs> I just I said so. I need to be on my own. It doesn't have to be with nature and animals. I just need. Um, um, somebody asked me, "Do you mind if I have a roommate?" I said, "The only roommate I do now is is my Rabbitson. I need quiet time." I need to be on my own. And that is, you use the word oxygen. It's a great word. It is. I, I realize now that's what it is. It's an oxygen. I think it's very healthy. I think that it's one of the things that uh, Revolver used to talk about this incessantly. People are scared of their own shadow. They don't want to be on their own. And I was teaching, I once in, in Michala back in the day, I made the girls go around by the gun on their own, completely on their own. And one girl, came back and says, nothing happened at all. I said, were you on your own? Yeah, it was me, myself, and my iPod. Now you know how old the story is. I said, you idiot, you got your music? Why does everyone have to be plugged in? Be plugged into yourself. Revolver, when he had a similar story, a guy comes running back in. He was out for three or four minutes, walking on his own. He came back like in a fluster. And Revolver said, who did you see? And he says, no one, no one, Rebbe. He says, who did you see? I'm telling you, I saw no one. And Revolver says, no, no, no. I tell you who you saw. You saw yourself. Mm-hmm. And people are afraid to get to know themselves. And, um, and this is a huge source of anxiety. If you get to be in touch with yourself and you have time on your own, it doesn't have to be with anyone. It's better without anyone. And, um, and just to be in touch with your feelings and what makes you you. Without that, I don't know how I survive. If if you could give over one message to our listeners to the world, what would your message be? Well, you 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 coming up with all these questions that He's deep in thought for those listening. So you already got me on a rant about Kira. You got me on a rant about spending time on yourself. <laughs> you got me on a rant about the power of tefillah. Final rant. The <laughs> final rant. <laughs> um, I said, Niflaus Lovado. I say Niflos Lovado. Hashem does wonders on his own. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need Nachi and your meaningful whatever it is. He doesn't need Yaakov. He doesn't need Menachem Nissel. He doesn't need anybody. He does everything on his own. And all we have to do is to ask Hashem for the schus, for the honor, to be part of this exciting period of history that we're in. I want to be part of the narrative. Hashem opens doors for us. 
But we have to remember, it's always, always him. Every person that becomes from the negative sides, which we'll put aside for the moment, but all the thousands and thousands of beautiful and positive things. I say, don't mess up what he's doing and ask Hashem for the schos to be part of his narrative. Beautiful. Thank you so much for, for coming on. Cheers, mate. Cheers. 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 <laughs> I pretend it's vodka. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're going to let our listeners know that they can get your new book that's coming out. <laughs> it's going to hit stores pretty soon. Thank you so much. And and and, and just after that, my book on Ramos Shapiro uh-huh. is coming out. Yeah. Very exciting. So in our outro, we'll make sure to you know let everyone know where they can get it. But thank you so much. This is incredible. Chaim. Thank Chaim. you so much. Huh? Wasn't that something? That was something. So Ravi Nissel is also, it didn't even come up as much, but he teaches in over eight seminaries, I wow. think. Yeah. And he does so much. I mean, he also, he teaches a lot about uh, parenting, which we didn't get involved in. He has what to do with Hollywood, which hmm. we didn't either. So we definitely have to have him back. Uh, Nach, you're you're talking about the the books, right? Yeah, he's got he's got a couple more books coming out. Mm. So make sure to check them out by Feldheim, I believe. That's where his books are being published. Make sure to check it out. And again, if you're new to this podcast, maybe you knew Rabbi Nissel, who's your teacher. Check out some our other some of our other episodes. Um, got some really great ones here. And click subscribe because it's the right thing to do. This this was this is uh, episode thirty. Wow. That's big. Big three zero. Big three zero. Mm. And uh, we're, we will soon be ending this season. We're going to go by year. So season one is 2020. And uh, we have a lot of exciting things for season two and a lot of guests switching some things up, adding a few parts to the show. And we'll get more into that then. But until then, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe and always try to work on your relationship with Hashem.